So if you've ever struggled on getting a listing or getting a seller to price their property at the right price, which will cause it to sell, this conversation is going to help a lot. I've grabbed one of the top coaches from our reverse selling community. We're going to break down seven specific things that you can do to not only secure a listing, to not only enroll new clients, but to get listings at the right price that will actually cause the property to sell. So it's a 30 minute conversation. There's really good takeaways. And if at any time you're watching the video and you feel as though you just need more support, more training, more accountability, I would offer you or invite you rather to have a conversation with us about potentially working together this year in a coaching relationship. We could talk about our 12 month listing agent academy program we can ask each other some questions and then you can determine if participating in that program at this time makes sense for your business if you're looking to generate a multiple six-figure income building a listing based business so with that being said enjoy the conversation i hope you get a lot of takeaways and we'll see you guys in another video very soon let's jump in so today i thought dominic you and i were talking um one of the questions we often get from from the agents that we coach one of the one of the things they struggle with the most and I don't know if it's a new agent thing per se or it's just real estate agents in general but but that is around how do I help prospects how do I help my sellers choose the right price so that their property sells or uh, doesn't sit on the market and end up becoming a stale listing because the question, that agents struggle with is, you know, I've got this seller, I've got this thing's priced too high, they won't reduce it, they won't price it at the right price. And it's a real challenge for, I think, a lot of agents on navigating those conversations. And so I thought on today's episode, you and I can really go deep on that, unpack that, and help the audience as much as possible. Yeah, about 100%. Um, I'm sure you have some framework that you want to work within, but yeah, right now with our market, a adjusting to a more normal situation. I mean, yeah, the last two and a half years have been absolutely crazy, but really the last five, six, seven years, um, you haven't had to get the price exactly right because you've had the benefit of waiting and the market will just catch up to where you are, right? Now we have a situation where consumers, buyers are ultra sensitive to pricing. They're acutely aware of what other homes, like what they're looking at or selling for, and you got to hit the nail on the head or you're just going to go stale. Yeah, that's a great point. And that is the exact right place to start, which is what you just said. And that is for the last couple of years, you didn't have to be good at pricing. You really didn't have to have your finger on the pulse. You could just list it at whatever price the seller wanted and you'd get that plus about 20,000, you know? <laughs> so it, would, it didn't even matter because we were in such a seller's market and the challenge to your point is all these agents that have never sold real estate outside of a seller's market. So call it the last five years that that anybody that's sold real estate with inside that tank, that time frame is truly struggling right now, because now you do need to understand the market. You do need to be an expert and you do have to understand not only how to price property, but I think what you would say is how to communicate that that to the seller is probably more important. It's one thing to be great at doing a CMA and coming up with the right price, but it won't mean a whole lot if you can't communicate that in a compelling fashion where the seller's like, wow, that's I never thought about that that way. Um, so I want to get your authentic thoughts on this and you're a great listing agent. You're a great coach. When you think about having a conversation with the seller and they say, Dominic, listen, I, I get it, dude. I, I hear you. I see all the data you, 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 you've provided. Um, I still would be more comfortable listing it at a price that is more than what you've suggested. What is it that you think about or what are some of the conversations that you have? And then, yes, we can break down seven specific tactical takeaways after we unpack your thoughts. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, almost every seller that you encounter 
ever <laughs> wants to sell their home for more than what it's probably worth. So that's very normal. What where I, where I start with that of where any any sale should start buyer or seller, but we're talking about sellers here is their motivation for making the move, right? Mm. Um, what what level of motivation do they have? And the reason that's important, let's use an example. Let's say that somebody needs to move to Florida. They have a job transfer. My company's sending me down there and I got to be there by April 1st. All right. So now you've got a framework, you've got a time, you've got a motivation. And, and I'm, I'm having that conversation and they say, Dominic, look, I know everything you're saying says we need to price at 500,000. I understand the price bracketing, but man, I, I really, I really got to get 550,000 for this house. And yeah. If I know in that circumstance that the motivation is strong, even though I've explained to the client that we're in a, here in my market, we're in a declining market. And I have a very specific conversation with them about days on market and what days on market means to them ultimately. And obviously the longer the days on market go, the less likely they are to achieve even even the original price that I suggested. And and so they really want to fight me on that. Um, and, and many do. I say, listen, Mr. Mr. Seller, I don't know. Do you want me to go into to, to, to well, conversation? Yeah, no, this is great. And so you're you you're getting right you're getting into a lot of the you know the specific points. And so maybe maybe it would be more appropriate that we get into one thing at a time and we unpack each one of them one okay. at a time. Yeah. So the audience can maybe if there's one or two people watching this that are taking notes that are actually focused. We'll we'll make it in in an organized fashion. So you know when you when you put that out there, the switch the switch flips, and I just go into all right. I know <laughs> that's great. That's great. So so let's break it down. So the okay. first thing I have on on my list is I think where this starts is the real estate agent first having a mindset of slowing down is that when I go into a situation to list someone's home, because of how much work goes into it, I want to have what we call a list to sell philosophy, not a list to list philosophy. And this is where I think this conversation starts because if the agent can have the mindset to say, okay, when I list a home, I am going to sell the home. There's not going to be a time where I commit to a project and not follow through on that project. Now, yes, of course, there are times when you list a house and you don't sell it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a mindset first, because I think here's the problem is a lot of agents will go into a situation with a list to list philosophy saying, I'll get the listing, but they're not that motivated. It's not the greatest price. The condition needs some help. And I didn't tell them the truth, but you know what? The, the hell with it. I'll just take the listing anyway. Uh, maybe I'll get some buyer leads out of it. Well, for me, I, I just think that's a bad mindset. I think the mindset, I think you're disservice. You, it's a disservice to yourself, to your company, to your family, and certainly to the seller. So what I like to do, Dominic, is with that mindset is then communicate that to the seller. Because I think if the seller knows where you stand, it opens up the ability to be honest with them, to tell them the truth. So I can sit down with the seller and say, Dominic, listen, there are a lot of real estate agents who would love to get their sign in your front yard, regardless if the house sells. And knowing why they would want to do that is important. And I might take some time to unpack that for the seller so the seller can say, man, because there's no better way to influence somebody than comparison. So we take that, we unpack that, and they say, I have, I have uh when I take on a project, when I when I serve my clients, I have a commitment to them in that when I list a property, I am going to do whatever is necessary to get their property sold because that is what they've hired me to do. Now, I guess my question for you, Mr. Prospect, is are you in that same mind frame? Do you absolutely want to sell this property? Do you absolutely need to sell this property? So what we want to do first, Dominic, and now I'll get your thoughts, 
is make sure that we have an expectation of what we expect from ourselves. That's the mindset I was saying. And then we also have a seller that has the same goal in mind. Because you have a lot of agents that will just list properties and you have a lot of sellers that will just list their home and they don't care if they sell. So I think, number one, you got to make sure those two things align. Your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, 100%. I guess at the beginning of our conversation, I just assumed every agent's going into a listing with that mindset, right? Uh, but I'm I, obviously, that's not right. Agents do do that. When I go into a listing, yeah, my goal is to... If I leave with signed paperwork, it we're all on the same page. This property is going to sell. And, well, and all- isn't that interesting? I, 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 because of, you know, it's unfortunate, but yeah, there's many that take listings knowing they're not going to sell. It's, it's the sad truth. And, and maybe, maybe it's not knowing they won't sell, but hoping they'll sell, but they took it at a, massively discounted rate of commission. They took it under uh, terms from the seller that are absolutely unreasonable. Like you can show the house once every three months. It's 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 in bad condition and at a price that no one's going to pay. That's what I mean. Agents are taking those listings all the time. And how do what you and I know that? Well, because look at how many listings expire. So, yeah. right? So, so your mindset and mindset, my mindset is the same. It's I'm going to sell this property because, Mr. Seller, I put so much into this that the reality is we're not going to work for free. And we have to make sure that the seller has the same mindset, that we're working with a seller that has the same end goal in mind. And so if if agents can watch out for that and make sure they're not working with sellers that don't actually want to sell their houses, then I think they'll be in, in good shape. So that's point I number think, one. Go ahead. Okay. Yep. Uh, and I, I may add a little color commentary Please. to that. I think I know where you're going with that, and that is that you you've got to be you've got to be willing to walk away in in any negotiation. The person who is willing to walk away is is going to be the the winner. And I don't mean that in a you're going to win with that particular client. I mean that you're not going to get saddled with a listing that becomes a liability and. If you're sitting across the table from somebody who isn't willing to accept accept your advice and your expert knowledge, if they're just flat out stonewalling you, this isn't the right client for you. And it's okay to say, Mr. Seller, listen, um, I can appreciate where you're coming from. It, it sounds like I might not be the right agent for you. That's and exactly then, what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, but if you have more prospect, if you're doing your time and you're prospecting and you're finding more opportunities, it's far more comfortable to get up from the table and to and to walk away friends rather than be feel like you have to take this listing. That's right. right. That's exactly right. And so that's what we call communicating from high value status is going into a meeting not needing anything, but rather looking for a good fit looking for the right person to serve at the highest level. And it's okay that they're not the right client for you because we're not, we're certainly not the right agent for everybody. So we don't go in there trying to twist arms and convince every Tom, Dick and Harry to get the listing at any means necessary. That's not what we're looking to do here. And so, yeah, that's a, that's a whole thing. All right. So point number two, once we've established this, you know, playing field that is now equal, where the seller has the right expectation, they want to sell. We've communicated the truth to the seller that we are going to sell the house. Come hell or high water, we are going to sell it. We're going to tell you the truth. We're going to shoot you straight. We're going to be honest. We're going to be professional. And that leads us into number two. Then it's our job to help the sellers understand who it is that actually determines the price of their home. This is another hard one because... Every seller, to your point, thinks emotionally that their home is worth more than it is. And it's our job as great listing agents, now that we have their permission to tell them the truth, is to do just that. And so we have to help sellers understand, this one's pretty simple, that it is the market and the buyers to which they are paying that determines the price of the home. It isn't the agents, it isn't the brokers, and it certainly is not the sellers. And so what are your thoughts on that point? I mean, that's what I say to people when I'm when I'm yeah. sitting across the table from them. I say, listen, ultimately, at the end of the day, 
you you and I don't don't decide how much this house is worth. Um, only buyers that are actively in the market, and then ultimately banks that are going to loan the money on this get to make that decision. Now, Mr. Seller, you can decide not to sell. That's certainly your decision. But if it, we don't determine the final sales price, that's actually one of the things that I say. So yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And they used to go, okay, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, and that brings me into point three, which is. Once we help them understand that buyers are the ones that ultimately determine the value and some sellers, I can already hear it is an agent's listening to this and saying, yeah, I get it. But the seller's still, that's not good enough. The seller's like, I don't care. This is what I want for my house. Cool. Then the next thing that we do is say to the seller, well, if the, if the buyers determine value, what can we do, Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, that will get those buyers to have urgency so that their willingness to give you a great offer is as high as possible. And that is by showing the seller the importance, the most important factor in, in getting a premium for their house, which is time. And so what I like to do here is show the seller literally on a report, the correlation between days on market, and list to sold price ratio. This is so important. And so when we show the seller a list of seven houses that have sold, and you can see clearly, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, that the longer these properties stay on the market, the less they end up getting. And we have to show that to them. We can't just tell it to them because they have to feel the correlation between how long it's taking their property to sit on the market and the offer in which a buyer is going to write on the property. You and I, when we teach and we coach the agents in our program, we do this by telling a story about making the seller the buyer of their home on the first day it hits the market and then making them the buyer for the home after it's been on the market for a long period of time. So the seller can really understand, wow, that's a great point. Myself included, this is the seller. I wouldn't give a seller a great offer. It's been on the market for a long time. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm just smiling because I've told that story so many times to exactly. so many different sellers, and it almost always has the same same exact effect. Um, it's the if you know if if then right. If we walked into this house on day one and it was perfect and it met all your dreams and expectations, what kind of offer would you feel compelled to write the seller? Right? That's right. And then we and we back it up and say, now let's say we came into the same house and it's been on the market for 97 days. You still felt the same way about it, but his home's been sitting here for over three months. What kind of offer will you be asking me to to write to the seller on this one? And they always get it. Always. Because yeah. we're using the Socratic method. Because we're, we're, we're out of the telling business and we're in the business of helping people discover things on their own. And the seller says, wow, that's a that's a great point. Uh, and so how in which we do that and, and by doing that, we help the sellers understand the importance of pricing it right from day one. It isn't the old school way of, well, we'll price it a little bit higher and because people always want to negotiate and that's, that's a lot of sellers mindset today. And so we help them understand that we've got to get it sold as soon as possible. This this will suggest that we come out of the gate with our best foot forward and the likelihood for the seller to get the highest price is not by pricing it high and going the opposite way, but maybe the opposite is pricing it right from day one and letting the buyers compete and driving the price up. So that brings me into point number four, which is then price bracketing and showing the seller the percentage of buyers by bracket. This is the face melter if there was one so all of the agents are oh, how do i get that report just contact showing time and you can you can get this data through them but dominic what you and i know and what we teach is how to how to show a seller the different brackets with inside of their marketplace and having the sellers understanding how brackets work first and foremost then we back it up and we show them the percentage of qualified buyers in each bracket based on the likelihood for them to get the premium for their home. 
And when a seller sees this for the first time, certainly there's no other mules showing this, right? It's only the top experts that are showing sellers what we're talking about. The seller says, wow, I want to play in that pool of buyers. Yes, I know. This is where we need to be. If you want to go to the next bracket up, you can see the huge 84% drop off in buyers. And so we can play in that arena. But if we do, all that means is that we end up sitting on the market for a longer period of time. And so the seller starts to see, wow, I can actually get more for my house by pricing it less. And they can see that for the first time. Your thoughts on bracketing and the ability to show sellers where buyers live. Yeah, we do that. And we have we we have the ability once the house, I mean, to your point, once the house goes on the market, we also have the ability to continually look at that. We can say, listen, Mr. Seller, the market indicated when we went on the market at, at 500,000, there would be 315 qualified buyers shopping for a home like yours. Now, uh, because you wanted to make sure we weren't gonna leave any money on the table, we entered the market at 525, and there's only 72 buyers in our market shopping for a house like this at this price point. So we're trying to attract one of 72 buyers here. If we adjust to where the market suggests we should be here, where there's 300 and whatever I said, 52 buyers, where do you think we're going to have a better shot of getting a great price for your home? It's phenomenal. And yeah. this is a simply a supply and demand conversation that the sellers can feel and see. It's not just them taking our word for it, which let's talk about point number five. So this is something I've been talking about that I don't think a lot of people do. And a lot of people talk about in the industry, but when I, th this is probably of everything we're going to discuss. And there's seven points. I think this is probably the most important that I don't see anyone doing. And, and that is Certainly, you want to bring with you information about properties that sellers would compete with. Certainly, you want to show them the actives, the pendings, and solds. Everybody's doing that, been doing that for 100 years. What no one is doing is either before, during, or after the meeting with the sellers to say, hey, let's go on a field trip and let's go walk through physically the three houses that also just hit the market that those 352 buyers are all going to look at. And I want us and I want you to understand what the buyer for your home, what they will experience, and I want you to feel it. And so I'll have showings that are set up for my sellers for the properties that we compete with when we hit the market. I don't know if there's anything more impactful than that. What, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, look, I, I love this play and I will... I'll also share with you, I don't know what your experience has been, but more often than not, just making that offer brings right. them back into alignment. Most sellers don't, when I when I put that out there, I say, hey, listen, these three homes are vacant and they're just like yours. And I've got some time Monday afternoon before we go on the market, we should go take a look at these. Most say, oh, no, you don't know what, I, I got it, I believe you we're all good, right? They don't yeah. take you up on that. But putting it out there and making it available to them is very powerful. Yeah. And the way I like to do it, as you know, I mean, you've mastered this skill as well, is using it as a third-party story. So vacant or not, I say one of the things that my clients love to do that they have found so beneficial is for me to set up a private showing with them so that we can actually physically tour the homes that the buyer's that we want to buy our home are also looking at. So we have a competitive advantage where we are actually looking at the competition. So we can go in there and see, okay, what is what what are the, the scratches on the wood floor from the dog look like in that house that you can't see in the photos? What, what are their, their finishes like in comparison to ours? What's the smells, the creaks, all the stuff you wouldn't get that buyers make decisions on emotionally that you can't get from photos. Dominic, I'd be happy to take you and your wife through these properties at any point in time, you know? And so recommending it through using a third party story of how you've served clients in the past, this is how I get the sellers to take me up on it. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's uh, super powerful. And you're right. I don't even know of anybody else uh, in my market that's actually doing that. Yeah. 
it's, it's just the best way of getting out of trying to convince people of anything. You want the seller to walk through a property that is objectively better than theirs and them say, wow, that's that was a beautiful home. As soon as that happens, it's like, okay, that's that's why we do that. All right, number six, what we also want to do. So here's the in in the the opposite of that is one of the best things that an agent can do at the beginning of a listing appointment is bring a list of properties that have failed to sell. And we show the seller, right? And so we have printouts and all the pictures. And one of the most powerful things that we can do is show a seller a house that is objectively superior than theirs at a price that is lower than the seller want and no one bought it. I mean, that is so... We're not trying to run a play on the seller. We're just trying to present the facts like an attorney so that we don't have to be in the business of telling anybody anything because they don't believe us, right? You, you, you and I know that that's the first rule, right? People don't believe what we say. So we have to just show evidence so that the sellers can discover all this information on their own. And so when they see a list of 14 properties and they start to say, wait a minute, that house didn't sell at that price? You're kidding me. They start to understand the reality, their new reality that they're in with this new market. What's your experience with with doing that with sellers? Yeah, again, uh, a very a very powerful tool to bring the seller into alignment with where the market currently is, and and now we have. We have a lot more of those uh, options to show sellers than we have in in quite a while. So yeah, I mean, no, yeah, very powerful. And sellers always are. There's always a moment of like realization, right? When you show them yeah. that, they're like, "Wow, that one didn't sell." Yeah, and I position that. I don't know how you do it, but when I show that list, I do it from the standpoint of I, I don't try to um, bait the seller into like, uh, you know, I told you so I let them experience their own emotions after looking at the data. I don't try to jump on that. I don't try to do any of that. I don't try to, you know, uh, manipulate that in any way. What I let them discover that on their own. But what I do do is I, I use that opportunity to explain that the reason the homes ended up that way was simply because the agent in which those people dealt with weren't willing to tell them the truth. And then that's how I start off every single meeting is by opening this up and, and using one of my favorite lines, which is, you know, and it goes, comes out a million different ways. It's not a script more. So it's a mindset of, I, I, the only, the only way I like to earn sellers business really is by telling them the truth. And if by telling them the truth, that that is hard for them to accept and I lose the listing based on the truth, that's fine. Because I don't want to win listings based on false promises. That's what happened, Mr. Seller, with these 14 properties. Is an agent came in here telling them things that seemed better than they were, got the sellers excited to sign a contract, and then end up having to be frustrated four months later when the house didn't sell now they're fighting an uphill battle to try to re-enter the marketplace. And there's no buyer that's going to give them a premium anymore. We've lost that opportunity. So I like that opportunity to do that right from the beginning to make an impression. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the first things I say when I walk in the door before we even sit down at the table, Mr. Mr. Seller. I mean, I'd rather hurt you right now with the truth than comfort you with lies. I mean, is that a problem for you? That's so good because there's no, I mean, you, you come across as just someone I can trust because you're not needy. You're certainly not desperate. You're not telling me what I, what you think I want to hear in hopes that I'll list my house with you. And that's the type of person I want to do business with. That's the high value status. Yeah. Last point, number seven. So let's pretend an agent, Dominic, does everything that we've suggested in this conversation, but they still have a seller at the end of the day saying, well, Listen, I appreciate it. I, I get it. I understand. Can we just try this price? Well, the thing that you and I teach the agents that we coach is to run what we call our one of three play. To set an expectation with the seller 
around one of three things that will occur. And we do it using the Socratic method. So when the seller says, I know everything suggests 500. Dominic, can we, you know, I just, I'd feel comfortable if we go out at 525. And then we set a really good expectation for future conversations before those future conversations ever happen. How do you set that expectation with the seller? If everything's aligned, you've got a motivated seller, they're the right person, but you still want to list the property at maybe a price that you think is too high. How are you setting expectations around what happens next? Yep. So um, the the wording and the phraseology has to be structured so that you that the seller feels like you're doing what's best for them. And That's right. The, the way I would present that exact case is, you know, listen, Mr. Seller, um, I, look, I understand every penny is critical here, and I don't want you to feel like you're leaving one single dime on the table. So let's do this. And then we talk about if we go on the market at 525, one of three things is going to happen, right? Number one, we're going to have a mob of people out front and we're going to get eight different offers and you get to choose the best one and we'll be high-fiving each other, right? That's the first thing, right? That'd be great. That's the best case scenario. The next thing that could happen is... And then that tells us that we hit the nail on the head, right? The next thing that could happen in the worst case scenario, the worst case is that nothing happens. It's crickets, right? Nobody calls, nobody comes. And Mr. Seller, what do you, what do you think that means? Yeah, and then you get them to suggest that the home is overpriced and that some type of adjustment is needed. Yep, yep. And of course, the third scenario is that some people show up and we might get we might get one offer or we might get no offers and we're close we're close we might need to make a small adjustment but we're but we're close and yeah so mr seller which scenario would you prefer would you like to have eight or ten offers to choose from well now now i've throttled that back right would yeah. you like to have two or three offers to choose from uh would you like to have people coming to your house steadily but not writing offers or would you like to have absolute crickets Nobody yeah. calls, nobody comes, you choose. Yeah, it's great. And having them decide. And the, the one thing I would add to that is just giving context around a time frame, right? Yeah. Because I spent the vast majority of my time with this seller talking about the importance of, or the correlation rather of, of time and the offer strength. So then I, I end the presentation putting the bow on it to say, listen, if within the time frame I've been alluding to for the last 42 minutes, you know, we'll just make up a number, 27 days. I mean, here's what we should, we should anticipate. I mean, every single other home that we've competed with that have come off on and sold successfully have all done so in an average time of 27 days. There should be no reason why you and I should experience anything different. Quite frankly, with rates coming down, we should be able to beat that. However, the expectation is if we are getting close to that number and we're sitting here having a conversation without an interested buyer, no offer, I mean, at that point, what do we need to start to talk about? And we got to get the seller to say, we have to get the seller to, to, to say price. We yep. cannot be the one to say it's the price. You got to get the seller to say price. Once you get the seller to say it's the price up front when you're signing the contract, when we're listing the house, then it makes every single thing in the future a lot easier. It makes it a lot easier to come back to that conversation to say, hey, remember when we talked about this? And I don't wait. I'm always reminding the seller, listen, we're at 27 day. So much so I put that on a checklist for the seller to say, all right, here's this is what we're up against, right? So we've got to get this thing under contract before we hit 27 days. And that's kind of like our game that I play with the seller that we're on the same team, you know, like this is our competition. Yeah, I mean, we we know based on data, based on our experience, ba based on the showing time information that a home priced at 525,000 in our county is going to get one to two showings a week, th two to three showings a week, whatever that number is. And so I'm setting the expectation with the seller up front. Now, listen, we can expect two to three showings a week 
And by the end of seven, eight, nine, ten days, we should have an offer to look at here. Yeah. And, and yeah. if we don't have an offer, now we're going to be talking about this all the time. Once a week, you're going to get a complete market update. Every day, you're going to get some sort of update on what's happening in the market around us. And based on all of that information, if we don't have an offer yet, we're, we're going to have to have a, another meeting of the minds and adjust accordingly. Yeah. No, it's spot on. Listen, great conversation. I hope that the agents that watch this got a lot of takeaways. There's a lot of notes. Um, if you guys have questions or if you want more help from a coaching standpoint, we'll put a link underneath this video. We'll put it in the description. I'll put it in the pinned comment. Feel free to schedule some time to, to reach out. We'll have a conversation about what it is that we can do to support you and serve you in your real estate business. We'll teach you how to build a listing-based business, have an opportunity to have a conversation, and then you can decide if maybe joining our Listing Agent Academy, Dominic, makes sense for them or not. So we appreciate it.